Nothing here. See how the situation is out there. Oh, I can smell. I can smell the brimstone. I can smell the hinges of hell in their sulfurous fumes writhing and coiling out there. I can smell it. Oh. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm torn between telling the truth and just being a tear-stained clown. Shall I tonight? Do you think you're up to it on this quiet, somewhat, somewhat nothing spring night? Are you up to the story of the great hamburger blow-up? You gotta tell that story. The night that I blew up like a turkey. Can you hear that snare? Oh, it's a terrible story. <laughs> no matter how hard you try, you're fighting against forces over which you have little or no control. Little or no. And the winds of chance, the idle hands of the claw of fate, speed you out on the green felt covering of the pool table of life. A small rolling die fighting against the chances of evil and depredation, degradation and defeat. The four horsemen of time immemorial. Oh. Or perhaps you'd like to hear the story of the great bad statue unveiling. For the night my father wept openly. Would you like to hear that story tonight? Or perhaps you'd like me to laugh through my tears. <laughs> yes, light up a shimmel thinking. Where are my shimmel thinkings here? Here I got them. Light up a shimmel thinking. Oh, prepare. Just a minute there. Come on, piano player. For crying out loud, don't run out on me now. You're just going to hang on. Hold on. Hold on. Cut him off there. Learn. Hold right there. This is the $200,000 mystery sound. Listen carefully. Oh, boy. Do you recognize that sound? If you do, you're sick. And uh, we'll be... Uh... Yes, I don't know whether or not to... to, to uh... To touch on this story, I, I paced the floor for half an hour before I came on the air tonight. Shall I tell him the story of the Green Hamburger blow-up tonight? This has been cooking in the back of my mind for at least two years. Whether to tell, maybe I ought to save this for the limelight. <laughs> or would you like to hear the story of the? terrible statue unveiling when my father openly wept in the streets of Chicago. Or would you like to hear me? Would you like to hear me? Come on, watch me. That's it. Would you like to hear me? <laughs> bring it up. Hi, bring it up.
doing it's obvious that all i'm doing is stealing myself uh to to uh tell that story it's a terrible story i don't know whether i should tell it or not no i no i've uh, i've tried to put this off no that's no use to beg <laughs> well uh there are times when when uh in each of our affairs you know we've lived along all of us have scratched and spit and holler my shimmel thinking's gone out all of which spit and hard and struggled along, you know. And we have each one of us, whether you're a kid or whether you're a grown-up, Bernard Baruch, whether you're Adley Stevenson, this is a shimmel thinking I'm smoking here. When the, whether you're Bernard Baruch, and no matter what you are, whether you're, I don't care, name all the important people of our world. There's John Gambling, there's... Uh, Trig Valley, all the big people. These, no matter who you are, you have had moments of absolutely blinding, purple, cataclysmic, totally involving. <clears throat> oh boy, I can't even go on to tell you this story. I, I, I'm, I'm just a kid. Of course, when you're, you know, when you're a kid, you're, you're just like a peeled grape. You're standing there with the little seeds there inside of you, you know. Oh, the sun shines down on you and you think everything is hotsy totsy and hunky dory. Yet you always suspect these are shimmel thinking. It's all right. Yet you always suspect that there is an evil dragon hiding in the bushes. You know? But then on the other hand, you can't believe that there is. It just can't. I gotta get this thing in tune. I can tell you this. Right, listen. Don't you laugh. Don't you laugh. There are stories that I could tell you. One. There are stories I could tell you would curl your hair. And these would just be stories out of real life. The things we've all lived through. The sniffing, rotten, grabbing, screaming stories deep down in the undergrowth of life and existence. And the socks are twisting in your tennis shoes. Yes, and the fetid heat of life itself is steaming out of your ears like some cold, cool wind of the August of eternity. Oh, we could all tell these stories. No question about it. It just remains for the artist in society to be the one clutch who gets up on a Campbell's pork and bean box and says, I'll say it for all of us. I might as well level for each one of you. I, I, I'm not exactly filling. Now, get get that button over there, the, the money button there. Watch it, Bob. Hold it there now. Now, if, if you promise not to... No, if you promise not to, to say too much about it. You know when a guy walks around, he gets grown up. You know, you're big grown-up people. And you own... Uh, you own a $40 suit, and, you know, you're all grown up, and you got a pair of shoes, the tie and everything, and you walk around, and you've got a couple of credit cards in your pocket. It's easy to pretend that you have never been shot down. 
<laughs> you know, in flames. I'll tell you that terrible moment. You know, <laughs> isn't it funny when whenever a kid reads stories, he reads stories about aerial combat. I, uh, when I was a kid, I used to always read stories about uh, aces. You know, who who flew airplanes and they fought against the the dreaded Checkernose Circus of Baron von Richthofen. And uh, they were always involved in these fantastic dog fights. And I can remember these pilots. They always the, the the pros ran something like this. He, he he bit into a tight chandelle and then felt the thrumming of the spandau bullets, the slugs ripping their way through his fuselage, closer and closer to his camelback. <laughs> he pulled back the stick. Up he went higher and higher and higher. The wind screaming through his struts, and now he was on the tail of the dreaded Baron himself. He paused. Well, you know. Uh, we, we're always winning in these stories. Always winning. We never see ourselves being shot down. Trailing smoke. Trailing smoke and outlined and etched against the sun. Well, I think tonight I might as well tell the story about the time I was shot down. <laughs> and I mean shot down. Oh, boy. And before we tell that awful story, hang on, folks. I hear the sound of the devil himself. Miller High Life in Pop and Pour cans. Distinctive Miller High Life in Pop and Pour cans. Just pop and pour Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. No opener needed. And inside every can, enjoy the hearty yet light goodness of Miller High Life. Brewed from a century-old recipe, only in Milwaukee. Miller High Life always gives you that perfect taste in beer every time. Always a bright, clear taste. Unequaled, unquestioned, unchanging. Now you can enjoy refreshing Miller High Life in Pop and Pour cans. Pop and Pour Miller High Life. Always sparkling, flavorful, distinctive. Now in Pop and Pour cans. Wow. <clears throat> um. Hello, test. Hello, hello. Yes, are we back on? Hello, hello. <laughs> I like to do that, you know. Uh, I'll give you a little inside tip here for those of you who are sitting out there scratching and spitting. The once in a while, the uh, the studio personnel, you know, they get all involved in equipment and all kinds of stuff. And uh, nothing I enjoy more than to come on the air. Once in, the, once in a very great while, see, I come on the air and the guy throws the mic on. And I say, hello, hello. Are we on? And they say, yeah, 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 yeah. They're pointing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, hello, hello. I don't hear anything in the fans. So I don't think it's working in here. Hello, hello. And I look like I'm about to say some fantastic obscenity. And they say, hey, 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 you turn around. Hey, hey. <laughs> Speaking of obscenity, this is WOR AM and FM New York. <coughs> oh, and the, uh, boy. Lucky we're not on the air. Holy smokes. And, uh, We'll, we'll be around here for a while. This is old uh, Victor Jory here. Well, the story, you can see that I, I just don't want to tell this story because it's a very unpleasant story. And I, I might as well warn those of you out there who are not prepared to accept life in the raw or, as George Aid used to say, life as she is. Uh, I'm giving you a little skull and crossbones now, right at this moment. <laughs> this program is not for women and kids. <laughs> That's... Uh, our disclaimer here. And, uh, oh, by the way, <laughs> this program does not represent the views of the management here at the radio station who hates Shepard. <laughs> he's got a drag with somebody higher than us. We'd like to know who it is. <laughs> That's why he's on the fink. <laughs> okay. That'll handle him for a while. And we'll push old Shepard around here. You got it there, and we'll be right back with the story of the time Shepard blew up like a Christmas turkey. <laughs> Is your car old enough to smoke? Surprising how many cars are. Is your car old enough to smoke? Surprising how many cars are. If your car is gobbling up oil, put it on a reducing diet. Just a can of Prestone Oil Miser added to your regular oil saves money. 
Prestone Oil Miser is just what the name says. It's a miser for saving oil, restores lost power, quiets noisy engines, stops oil burning in any car. Get Prestone Oil Miser in the can with a handy tear-off top. Insist on Prestone Oil Miser. It helps save oil, save money, save your car. If your car's old enough to smoke, surprising how many cars are. If your car's old enough to smoke, get Prestone Oil Miser. That's wiser by far. Prestone Oil Miser is a product of Union Carbide. I don't know. Let's hear it again. Get down on your knees. Please. Please what? Tell a story about the hamburgers. Please. And there, I might as well face it. You just can't uh, continually flaunt the public. That's the truth. Uh, you just... <laughs> you know, I'll tell you. Well, it's funny about these little stories. We all have... Before we tell this, I've got to tell this thing unbroken, absolutely, without any without any interruptions. And so let's get rid of our little commercialese here. And uh, we'll get them out of the way. And then we'll tell the story of this terrible time. Because <laughs> you do have to give a... Uh, you do have to give a disclaimer. And, uh, oh, no, no, really, when, when you're dealing with loaded stuff... When you're dealing with reality and the way it is, you've just got to tell people, now forget it, this is not Burt Parks, this is not the John Gambling Show, and uh, this is liable to turn out to be life itself. And so before we go into that, let's get rid of a few of these little commercials, get them right out of the way. And the first one we've got here is Peugeot. And uh, let's see, what can I tell you about Peugeot that I haven't already told you? One, it's, uh, it legitimately is one of the top seven automobiles in the world as judged by a British automotive magazine of outstanding uh, stature and they mean it and I drove a Peugeot myself five years did I tell you about the time I drove my Peugeot I had a 403 by the way in case you're interested in what one I had I had a steel gray 403 which was one of the best automobiles I've ever owned in my life and I've been selling Peugeot to people unofficially for years and uh, the word got out that I ought to sell them officially. But did I ever tell you the story of the time I drove a Peugeot through a blinding snowstorm in the Allegheny Mountains a couple of years ago with a crosswind of about 117 miles an hour? And I'll tell you, with my heater turned on full blast, with the, with the wind so high and so heavy that I could actually hear... I could hear it banging against the trucks ahead of me and behind me. You know, that boom. Oh, boy, what a night. This is when you really learn how a car works. And if you don't know about the Peugeot and you're thinking of buying a car this spring, I would most respectfully like to recommend that you find out why this car is considered one of the seven best-made automobiles in the world. And the other ones, by the way, are Rolls-Royce, Mercedes-Benz, uh, the Rover, they consider the Porsche, uh, the Lancia. There are seven other cars that are... And the only U.S. car on the list, by the way, is the Lincoln, in case you're interested. Uh, this is a fine automobile, and if you'd like to get pictures of it and the little whoopies that you can hang up on your wall, uh, send your name and address to Peugeot. And by the way, nobody's going to... They're not going to use it as a customer list or anything like that, so don't worry about it. Send your name and address to Peugeot, P-O-O-J-O-E, Peugeot. Uh, <laughs> uh, care of me, friendly Fred, here at WOR, and I'll see to it that three months will go by before you get it. That's Peugeot, and their dealer here is at, at 2 East 46th Street, right in the heart of the fantastically overpriced rent district. That's 2 East 46th Street, right off of 5th Avenue. That's Peugeot. <sighs> okay? All right, polish that one off. Let's see what else we've got here. Would you please give me a little sad fanfare there? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's it. There, face it down. And we have a new sponsor for you tonight. And um, if you are a person that likes to stuff yourself and be an absolute rotten, slobby pig... I would like to suggest a fantastic Chinese restaurant. As you know, I'm a real aficionado of Oriental food. Now, that doesn't mean I know a lot about it. I just like to gallop it down. And uh, I, I would like to recommend a Chinese restaurant that, does, that truly is different. 
Uh, you've heard me talk about Mandarin House and, and uh, Mandarin East. And this uh, is in the same general group. As a matter of fact, the same people run it. Uh, but it's an extremely different one from all the others. And it's simply called, what a great name for a restaurant, happiness. That's all, just happiness. <laughs> you know, I think that that is one of the most charming names for a restaurant I've ever run into in my life. Uh, just happiness. And it's between 93rd and 94th on Broadway. And their, their, uh, their food is that the absolute, that they skim the top of the absolute best dishes from Sichuan, Shanghai, Peking, and Canton, and it's gourmet food, and the prices are unbelievable. In fact, you just think like, you know, that any minute now as you're leaving, somebody's going to put their hand on you and say, come on, fella, start paying here. And they have a 10-course meal that is served Chinese family style, you know, with a cart, they move it around. And you can eat as much as you like. She's, uh, uh, the manager says, don't say much about that side of it, but you can. You can eat as much as you like, literally and absolutely figuratively, for $2.25. That includes soup and the whole works. A 10-course meal. It's happiness. Between 93rd and 94th, they're open seven days a week, and it is one of the best Chinese restaurants in New York. Happiness. Okay. Oh, by the way, before I go there, before I run away, we are going to have a party for the listeners there within the next couple of weeks. So prepare to come down. We are going to have a party, and it will be a going away, Shep, and you better not come back too quick party. No, no, that's true. I'm going to go to Australia in a very few weeks, and I'll tell you all about it. But we're going to have a kind of a going away type party. And uh, so you prepare it. We're going to go down to the Happiness Restaurant or up to the Happiness Restaurant and uh, get ready for this. All right? What's the matter? Don't look mad. I mean, you, you can come. It's all right. I'll invite you. And uh, what else do we have here? One more. We have Union. No, American Heritage. One more. American Heritage Magazine. Uh, this is a run-of-the-station thing, so don't get alarmed. If you haven't uh, seen American Heritage, a big, fat magazine with hard covers. And you can bang it on your knee and hit people with it and throw it at people and stuff. And it costs uh, $4 uh, ordinarily, and they'd be glad to send you a representative copy for one buck. You just send your one buck to 711, Box 711, American Heritage, Great Neck, New York. One buck. And you'll get a copy of the old American Heritage. You know, speaking of American Heritage, since we're here, and I'm not discussing the magazine here, uh, are, you, are you a great reader? Of uh, of uh, boxes, of labels. Uh, do you ever read the back of Wheaties packages when you're sitting there? When you're insane, I am such a I, I'm commi I'm committing the sin of admitting a weakness here, but I'm a compulsive reader. I have to have something to read all the time. Now th th that is moments, you know, like when you're eating or something like that, or you're walking around, you. You uh, have a second between things and you, you read. I always carry a book with me, but sometimes I'm caught without it. And I am a genuine reader of junk and stuff. And I ran across a thing, and I, I wrote it down here. I, I, I just, just had to bring it with me. And in passing, I, I thought I'd just mention this in passing. But it was one of, the great, one of the great labels that I've read in a long time. And uh, it is, was on, of all things, I'm in a supermarket. And I'm walking around, you know, looking at stuff in the supermarket, paying very little attention. And I came to this, the, the little Crudley's department, you know, the little department where they sell things like, uh, like olive picks, plastic olive picks, you know, and stuff like that. Little, little doilies to put underneath your martinis. Uh, you know, the little junk department. And it was in the toothpick division of the junk department. Are you aware that there is a World's Fair toothpick? <laughs> There's an official World's Fair toothpick. <laughs> Somehow, you know, the World's Fair started out with such great ideas. Peace through understanding and all that jazz. Tremendous generalities about man's condition. And they wind up by producing a World's Fair toothpick. And I... I <laughs> why is it called a World's Fair toothpick? And what makes a World's Fair toothpick better and different from other World's Fair toothpicks? Here's the description of a World's Fair toothpick read to you directly off the box. Uh, can I have a little uh, dramatic music, please, behind this? That's very good. World's Fair round toothpicks are pointed by gradual tapering from center to ends, which allow 
more of the toothpick to pass between the teeth, facilitating gum massage as well as removing food particles. These are official World's Fair round toothpicks. Can you imagine the scene? Somewhere, someplace, a copywriter writing deathless prose to be found on a package of World's Fair round toothpicks. He sits there for a moment, then he says, I've got it, Chief! I've got it! What makes that toothpick different and better than all the toothpicks? What do you mean they're the same? No, they're not the same. They'll not be the same when I finish writing about World's Fair round toothpicks. Now, how do they look, boss? Think about it for a minute. Are ours flat toothpicks? Are ours skinny toothpicks? Are ours short, fat, blunty toothpicks? No, Chief. They're gradually tapered from end to end. From the middle to each end, gradually tapered. Allowing one to massage the gums. To remove particles of food with both ends. And so, the World's Fair Round Toothpick Chief has a character all of its own. <laughs> he types frantically, madly, and forever. It's enshrined on the back of a box. Have you ever thought about those boxes? No, the stuff that's on the back of the cream of wheat package. The stuff that's on the side of the dial soap wrapper. The stuff that's, uh, that, that writing, you know, that's on the can of oh, Prestone you buy, you know, <laughs> the stuff you put in your radiator. Have, have you thought of somebody sitting down writing that? The guy's really a writer. He goes home and he's writing. He's been writing and he's a writer. But almost every writer I've known, even guys who write recipes on the back of uh, frozen fudge boxes, almost every one of these guys had at one time an idea he was going to write a novel. Yeah. Everybody who's ever put three words together, big sign says, Ice cold, beer. He thought of himself as a writer. <laughs> I did, you know. And even in some, some dark soul of the night, he still thinks of himself as a writer. He sees... Do you, do you ever... Can you imagine a guy collecting his works? He's got all these boxes. And he's got all these cartons. And once in a while, when friends come over, he says, Have you read my latest? It's on the cream wheat box. Oh, did you see? Rich, creamy, delicious. Sticks to the ribs. A warming breakfast. How do you like that? A warming breakfast sticks to the ribs. You notice the beat and the rhythm. It's a little Thomas Wolfe there. Uh, cries out for the rich, deep Americana of an American breakfast that sings from the deep, wild, flat plain lands where the, where the rice grows. And where, oh, sure. The writer is everywhere. Now, look, you don't want me to tell you the story about the hamburger, do you? <laughs> Everybody say, tell us the story. All right, I'll tell you. This, this is something that I have not wanted to admit to for a long time because, well, let's face it. What is more American than a hamburger? In fact, it's even found its way. It's been enshrined in pop art. And the American hamburger is known all over the world. In fact, you know, the hamburger is more American, really, than the hot dog. That you see hot dogs all over Germany has more hot dogs than we have for crying out. This is, a, you know, the Frankfurter. You know, the Frankfurter, when you read Frankfurter, that means a sausage made in Frankfurt. That the Frankfurter that we have here is a classic German sausage. And so when you say hot dog is an American dish, forget it. That's not an American thing. And, and uh, the hamburger, however, is. And you, d you never want to admit somehow that you got off the course somewhere in Americanism. Well, <laughs> do you know, and, and I hate to admit this, I don't want to tell this uh, out loud, but I must have been at least 18 or 19 before I could actually eat and enjoy a hamburger. And it took me at least two years after I again tried a hamburger. It took me at least two years before I could really eat them without any qualm, a funny feeling deep down inside in the pit of the stomach. I wonder how many of you have ever had something physical that happens to you that results in a traumatic experience. <laughs> now, now, a traumatic experience, now, when a lot of people use that word wrong, you know, they, they'll say a traumatic experience is anything exciting that happened to them or sickening or anything that was, uh, you know, a big thing that happened to them. But a true trauma, 
Look the word up. That's a good word. Trauma. It's uh, every even the word is a very descriptive word. Trauma. Say it to yourself. Trauma. Yeah, trauma. That's that's a word. It's kind of a it's a word that shudders. You know. <laughs> a traumatic experience is a, is an experience that is is the equivalent. If you're going to take an equivalent in nature, it's the equivalent to a genuine earthquake. I mean, it goes to the core of things. And you have a traumatic experience, and it goes all the way down into your foundations, the little rocks that your soul is built out of, the little mortar and the little bricks that your psyche is made from. When you have a traumatic experience, little cracks appear in it. Runs right down the side, and you don't fix it that quickly. No, it's, it's, it's like you've bent the frame in your car or something. It's always out of line. It's out of tilt. It's out of kilter. Well, I had a traumatic experience that involved hamburgers that I know I've never told this on the air. Well, let me tell you the story. <laughs> I have never told this because it, it's, it's something that has become folklore and legend in my family. It's a legendary thing. It, it's the time Genie, which is what I was known by a certain wing of my family, the time Genie blew up like a Christmas turkey. Have you ever seen turkeys in the window of stores? You know, just before a big holiday like geese and turkeys, and they blow them up. Have you seen that in the windows of uh, butcher shops? And the turkey gets round and hard like a drum, big and fat. I'm not talking about the frozen food department. They're big. Boo! They blow them up somehow. Well, let me tell you. It was late in the fall of the year. It was just about the time uh, when the when the wind was getting a little nippy and edgy, and there was a kind of a kind of cold breeze blowing through the trees. This is the time when the soul is wide open. It's the time that almost every Sherlock Holmes story opens. Well, you know, Sherlock Holmes hardly ever opens uh, the real Holmes stories hardly ever open on bright sunny days. Oh no, the wind was beating against the digs in two twenty one Baker Street. And the howling gales of November were beginning to, to rattle the tiles of the roof. And they could hear outside suddenly as the fire is roaring in the, in the fireplace. And Holmes is sitting slumped over in his old chair, his chin on his chest. And Dr. Watson is leafing through a volume of forgotten medical lore. They could hear the ominous... <laughs> the sound of a carriage stopping in front of that winter-bound digs at 221 Baker Street. Holmes looks up, his thin, slitted eyes, lidded like a pair of serpent's eyes. Watson, Watson, quick, are you armed? Do you have your revolver, Watson? We are being visited by Professor Moriarty. <laughs> the sound of a neighing horse. Yes, well, it's that kind of weather that you're open for traumas. And it seemed, it seemed that one of the <laughs> one of the Ukrainian American clubs in our area, we had a million Ukrainian American clubs, Polish American clubs, there were Czechoslovakian American clubs, there were Swedish American clubs, there were Irish American clubs, there were Somaliland American clubs, there were Nome American clubs, there were <laughs> Antarctica American clubs. We had all kinds of clubs all around the area where I grew and festered on the northern fringes of Indiana, laying there like a great fast pool table, locked in the, in the grip of the dunes and the lakes and the wind and the howling winter breezes. Well, there it is. The Ukrainian American Club was having a big winter picnic. Have you ever been to a winter picnic? Well, they had them out there. And they had it in the forest preserve. And they had big fires, big roaring fires, and everyone wore their, their, their fur hats with the earmuffs. And I was a kid, and I was busting in with Flick and Bruner and Schwartz. We were freeloaders. Whenever anything happened down at, the old, down at the old forest preserve, Flick and Schwartz and Bruner and I would get on our bikes and pretend we're Ukrainians. Or we would pretend we were Croatians. Or we would pretend we were Ku Klux Klaners or whatever it is that was having its big picnic down there. We would go in, yeah, actually, because they always have free food, you know. We're knocking it down. There were a lot of little chicks and everything around there. Well, the Ukrainian Americans 
believe it or not, at their gigantic bash, their big winter clam bake there, and they were dancing and hollering and doing the shotish or whatever it is the Ukrainians do, and the guys were playing the accordions, and the ladies were jumping around. You could see their breath flying. You could smell them. Oh, boy, it was wild. They had a fantastic charcoal pit that must have been 45 feet across with spits going across it, and they were making hamburgers with hot buns, with ketchup, with big, thick slices of ice-cold Bermuda onions, and with gigantic gaboons full of mustard. Well, good Lord. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was about, I was about ten. Now, now, I, little knowing that I was about to embark on a genuine traumatic experience. And I'm not embellishing this. I am not inventing this. Schwartz and Flick and Bruner and I got into line for the hamburgers. We had on our sheepskin coats. We looked like all the Ukrainian kids. You know, there were thousands of them. I just, I just kept hollering words like, Tashi, Karabara, Ainam Turum. You know, stuff like that. And, and we, we just go through the line. And, and there was this great big Ukrainian with his wife and about 17 other Ukrainians. But he's at the head of the line. And he is, he is handing out the hamburgers on a paper plate. And he'd lay that hamburger down, and he would just reach down into a great big tub he had and put a gigantic handful of potato chips on it. Just potato chips. Well, the instant we get our hamburger, we'd go darting off behind the trees and the bushes, and we'd ah, 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 you know, stuffing it in our mouth because we wanted to get back in the line real quick see, before they ran out. Oh, they were fantastic hamburgers. Into the, into the gullet, it goes, ooh, the mustard and the ketchup and the onion. Oh, just great. Back at the end of the line. And we're hollering, and I'm told I'm Tashik, ah, the Polymosh, oh, we're yelling. Well, we're going through the line, and the Ukrainian gives me another hamburger. Well, conservatively estimated at this point, I had approximately 17 hamburgers. Each one of which tipped the scales of it about three quarters of a pound. Big charcoal hamburgers. Well, I, 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 I want to unbinge. You know, it's free. You know that nuttiness when, when there's something free, you've got to eat it all. I Believe me, if the state of Ohio was being offered free, if you were going to eat it, I would start up at, I would start at Toledo and I wouldn't stop until I hit Cincinnati, if it was free. Well, it's that kind of thing. So if I'm eating the hamburgers, back I go. And each hamburger, of course, came with about a half a pound of potato chips and about 17 quarts of ketchup. So I go through the line. I go back, go through the line, go back and go. And, of course, all the rest of these guys were great big, you know, steel workers, big bohunk, big Ukrainian steel workers. They could put away 45 hamburgers and nobody's saying any any, any the difference. All the while, the music, you know, they play that. Have you ever heard the Ukrainians dancing? They start hammering, you know, with the beer steins. Oh, you know, it goes on and on and on, the whole scene. And I am eating hamburgers from about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I would say to roughly 9.30 at night. Non-stop. Well... The time is up now. They're beginning to, you know how they begin to fade into the darkness. You could hear the cars starting. The embers are burning down, and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner and I are clearing out the last of the potato chips. We have done away with a ton and a half of them. And now I am home. I am feeling great. Just feeling absolutely magnificent. I have scored in the free kid world. I have drunk 17 bottles of knee-high orange, which they were giving away free to the kids. And I am now in my sack. And I am sleeping under, we had, we had this quilt, see, I'm, I'm, I'm under the quilt, I'm lying there, feeling good and warm. And suddenly, I began to swell. I'm telling you the God's honest truth, I'm swelling. I'm telling you the truth, I'm swelling out from under my pajamas. I'm beginning to bulge. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I can feel it. And it's getting tighter, it's like I'm going to blow up actually blow up and I could feel something bubbling and something pushing up some from inside my head was being stretched on my neck it was coming out my feet were going down at the bottom and, and, and begin to bulge up and up it's now about 9 30 quarter to 10 it's now 10 o'clock it's it's 10 15 it's 11 I can hear my mother and father talking quietly out in the living room and I am bulging I'm bulging it's getting bigger and bigger and then the first wave of insane Unbelievable pain hit me. <laughs> A gigantic shuddering pain. 
Oh, what a pain. I lay there. And then it began to grow again. Higher and higher and higher. And my mother says, what's the matter, Jeannie? She came in and pulled back the covers. And she said, you're blown up like a turkey. Like a turkey. And it grew higher and higher until there was a thin scream of gas coming out of both ears. I was ready to blow my overload relay. And all night long it got worse and worse until suddenly it's five o'clock in the morning. I could see nothing but great red flashes before my my mother's got cold cloths on my head. My father's massaging my feet. My kid brother is sleeping and crying alternately under the bed. And I'm going, oh, oh, oh. And finally at 5.30 in the morning, boom! Ah! Wah! 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 17 quarts of moderately dissolved hamburgers came flying out. I lay there. I was blown up like a Christmas turkey. It was like I had a safety valve on the side and it was stuck. And from that day on, every time I saw a hamburger, I could taste a funny acid taste in the air. A strange feeling of my nose itched. You know how the stuff comes out of your nose and out of your ears and everything else? And it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I could even look a hamburger in the face and even